There we go. Test one, two, three. Yes. It's working. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Barry Green. I work for Internet Systems Consortium, and this is a session that forgot to leave a it forgot a word. This is actually the Service Provider Security Toolkit. Now, of course, in the Service Provider world, the toolkit approach—if you're backbone engineers or anything—this is stuff that everybody should know because the way we protect our, our infrastructure, this is what this session is all about. Um, so, uh, so if you're looking for another session, right? well, you can see the other tutorials going on in parallel. Um, I was asked to do these materials. These materials, some of these materials I've done before, but um, as I'll explain in a, few, in a few minutes, these are materials that are being reinvested in because as I'll talk about our security issues going on on the net, are not going uh, decreasing, they're increasing in very dramatic ways. And um, as you've seen in the uh, NANOG registration stuff, there's always a major security theme. So um, let's do a couple of housekeeping clarifications. Um, this is a two, two set, this is a back-to-back -back session, so we're going on until five o'clock. We'll take, take the break in between around 3.30. Um, at any time, you guys can ask questions, right? So this is very interactive and dialogue. We're all we're all peers here. We're all engineers. These materials are are kind of like a co collective. Um, as I'll explain, in, as part of my role in the community, is is a lot of times somebody will come up with an idea. We'll work on it on a backbone. We'll get it tested. We'll defend the backbone, and then I'll do the PowerPoint slides. <laughs> right? It's actually somebody else who figured out the technique, but they can't. They can't use their name, right? So, so that's how it is. So a lot of the materials that we develop on here are that you'll see are is a community effort. Um, if it's not black this time, I say, wait a minute, it's not black, it's blue. <laughs> Usually it's a black dot, but it's a blue dot this time. Um, there are dots in the front, right? And anybody who deals with security on your backbone and you want to find your peers, and I'll talk about why this is important, go ahead and put the dot on there. The red dot, that's your PGP key, right? Because there are times when something's severe and we have to go into PGP mode and we do do encrypted communications and stuff like that. And of course, the green dot, if you don't know about that one, that's for peering. We got people walking around here and says, let's peer, let's peer, all right? So, um, so again, dialogue, ask questions, looking for clarifications, and then uh, he's looking for the power strip which is Warren over here, who is one of the people I'll point to, you know, he's one of the, one of the security people that get to know in, in the internet world because he's actually documented some of the techniques and RFCs and things. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, let's go ahead and get started because there are a lot, even with the, with the what, three hours we have, an hour and a half break, then an hour and a half, uh, there's no way we can go through all the materials. As a matter of fact, the last time I did a full set of this before I was asked to resuscitate, which we're, we're doing um, now at Inter Systems Consortium, I was with Cisco Systems. The last time I did the full set of these materials, um, it was a five-day program, eight hours a day. There's a lot to service provider security of how do you actually protect your backbone and considerations you need to make. And a lot of it is engineering orientation of, of how it works with it. Um, so these materials up here, those of you who have computers, and I'll refer back to this, um, where you can get the materials is um, I've, I've resuscitated something I did when I last did this before, which is what I like to do is I do everything as open as possible um, uh, because that allows me to work with my peers and my colleagues, the people who are running much bigger backbones. Um, right now I'm in charge of, I mean, in our Cisco consortium, we got F root and we got our backbone, the F 1280, right? So I'm actually um, uh, running a network now um, with my team. 
Um, but when I worked for a vendor, I didn't run a network. So I depended on a lot of my peers, a lot of people like you who actually ran networks. And so we collected on a wiki the kind of like the PowerPoint presentations, the white papers, the write-ups, the configs, and things like that. So um, you'll hear me throughout this session. Anybody here who's really interested in trying to deploy this stuff, I want to get a relationship with you. You know, get you contact with the site, right? A share information, right? And, and we do this in the kind of a very open, open way as we put these uh, materials that could help you out. Um, so uh, confluence.isc.org is the site name. Um, the core goals of these is, is to get a lot of the fundamentals out. The toolkit approach is an approach to service wire network backbone security, cloud security, where um, there isn't like one way to solve a problem. And because, the, as I'll talk about with the criminal threat, it evolves so fast and so much and so variance that there isn't like, you know, let's use a hammer to do, you know, solve the problem all the time. It doesn't work that way. Right, a, a good craftsman will have a tool box and different tools, and the tools are ready to go. You'll know how to use the tools. You'll be prepared. Now, it's not one of those things that, that says, oh, um, I need to do remote trigger black hole to stop a DOS attack. How do I configure it on my network? Too late. You want to prepare ahead of time. You have your toolbox ready to go. Right? Then when something happens on your network, you figure out which tool is appropriate for that particular issue and incident. Right? So this is kind of like the approach with it. So these programs, these classes at Nanog are designed to, to get the fundamentals out there. And then privately and with our peers, we start working on getting the deployment, the details, right, with it. So we can get it deployed on, on, into your network. Um, there are some new drivers. Um, I wasn't planning on doing this if I was asked to by the community. So yet another one of those things is, hey, can you start pulling all these materials together? Because there are key drivers that are going to be impacting all of you. Everybody who's running a backbone in the world right now, uh, what I call cyber civic society is asking backbone providers, cloud providers, hosting providers, social uh, network providers to do their part to help protect them. The cyber criminal threat is just increasing to the point where people said, hey, everybody's got to do their share. There isn't one person responsible, but everybody's got to do their share. So you're getting regulations, you're getting guidelines, you're getting uh, market demands, um, you're going to have um, uh, underwriters from insurance companies all coming down and say, do something, right? So, so um, starting to pull the materials together so that way you can say to like an underwriter, insurance underwriter, who's coming down to your lawyers and your lawyers are coming down to you and says, what are we doing? What are we doing? Says, oh, we're doing something. Oh, good. Because what the underwriters want to know is, is, are you doing something? And you say, well, here's a list of things we can do. It's not going to be everything. Right, because every network's going to be different. What you have the capacity to do would be different, but at least you can draw upon these materials and start doing things. And a lot of these techniques and things like that are multi-purpose. Like for instance, total visibility, understanding exactly what's happening on your network, is something you should know so you know what's going on with your customers. Your marketing people and your salespeople would love to know exactly what's going on with your customers. And oh, by the way, it'll also help you figure out who's infected. <laughs> right. So a lot of the techniques and tools you deploy. Um, are to techniques and tools that will help you out. Um, a technique that isn't taught in this one, but I'll do it for another future Nanog, is where you use um, um, SLA, IPPM, Inter Inter Provider Performance Metrics, as a tool to actually use QoS variables, SLA variables, to find out when there is a, um, a security issue that's impacting all your customers. And you can use that as a measurable metric, right, for security, right, but you also would deploy it so you can sell it as a SLA service, right? So it's like dual purpose. So a lot of the stuff we talk about here, you can use it for one avenue and another out in the security avenue at the same time. Um, Key principle you hear throughout is all of us working together. One of the things um, when I was asked to work on this, um, start focusing on service fire security back in 2000, um, the thing that Still today, that amazes me is how willing engineers in different companies or competitors are willing to work with each other. I mean, the collaborative nature is powerful. It's, it's basically protected in that through some really ugly times because of the collaborative nature behind the scenes. Um, that all starts here. <laughs> it's having the beers and getting to know people here at places at Nanog, at Ripe, at Apricot, things like that. So. Um, 
feel free, you know, to reach out. And if you don't know people, one of, I'm one of the people you can say, hey, Barry, you know, you get to know me here at this tutorial session. And hey, Barry, I need to get to know somebody at, at you know, Google. Who's a Google security guy? Oh, Warren, right? <laughs> right? So, you know, I'll, I can do the introductions and you get to meet, right? And these connections are powerful. They're very powerful. They, they go a long, long, long way with it. So what are we going to cover today? We can't cover everything, so we're going to cover some key fundamentals so that those of you who are brand new to this, those of you who have seen this before, um, get like, okay, here's some like, kind of like an action list of things I should go back and work on. Um, those of you who've been seeing some of this before, you get an insight in some of the, uh, the, the threat vectors that I'm seeing out there. Um, so you get some extra. So people who've seen some of this before, you'll get some extra stuff that, you know, um, what I'm seeing out there, and then we'll get to talk through uh, the, these core core techniques. Um, and then, whoop, finish you there. And then, so these this is kind of what we're going to cover. Um, one question first, um, how many people here are first-time Nanog people? Okay, excellent. Welcome to Nanog. <laughs> Welcome to our tutorial session. So I'll, I'll see to you. How many people have been to two Nanogs before, right? Two or more, right? All right, so these you guys are old timers. Once you've been to a second one, <laughs> you know, um, so welcome. Um, again, expectations, we can't cover everything. We won't go in depth. But see, I can go in depth with anybody here as you start going, hey, I want to go, I want to get um, a community-based remote target black hole configured on my network. And I'll help you. I'll dialogue with you to get it deployed. Um, I want to get, um, uh, I'm not going to go in depth on uh, source address validation, but I've got more experience working with more networks and configuring more BCP38 ports than probably any individual on the planet. I've worked with 16, 17 big providers, all of China, right? China Telecom on the edge of the network, right? There's, there's a ton of people I've, I've worked with that out there and got a lot of experience with it. And if I don't have time, I'll find one of my peers and as I said, it's the willingness to share is pretty astounding out there. Um, the other thing is the invitation to participate in the development of these materials. So some of you who have been doing some service wire security work and you want to share techniques, I'd love to talk to you. Love to get those techniques documented. Love to help you present them here at Nanog. As I said, there's a security theme always over here at Nanog and we have ways to present. We can present in tutorials like this, so something that's long enough for a tutorial, like all the deep details and technical configuration stuff. Oh, we can present it in a session. We can present it at a lightning talk. We can present it at the BOF. Like if you're if you don't want it taped, so it's okay. Let's present at the BOF, right? So the whole range of it, right? So those of you who are new, we're always looking for um, you know new speakers, new techniques, new ideas. Um, you know, say hey, this is what I did to help protect my network, or here's what we did. Here's a case study, right? We'd love to get that materials out there. So if you if you say hey, I want to learn how to speak, I got some security stuff. Come see me, I'll help you get up there. I've been on a program committee for a couple of times. I'm not on a program committee right now, uh, but I can, I can chaperone you through that whole process um, uh, to get it done. Uh, as a matter of fact, to give an example, several years ago, um, Chris Morrow, he wanted to show off a particular uh, uh, backscatter traceback um, technique that he was using with, with remote target black hole. And so I did the slides, <laughs> right? Got the gear in. He actually did a demo, right, on, on the whole session. We did a tutorial session with it. Um, and he did the session. So I did the PowerPoint and got the equipment for him so he can do the demo. He configured the demo. He did the session. And that was the first time Chris Morrow presented at Nanog as an example, right? So, so that's the sort of stuff we can do with it, looking for that. So let's give an overview of this program. Um, boss calls you up. The network's down. What do you call it? What do you tell your boss? I mean, this is kind of like the, the core th the thing of it. You know, security causes outages, right? <laughs> and we don't want that to happen. Uh, the big watershed for the, for the service fire backbone industry happened in February 2000, ANOG, right? Um, it was in San Jose, California. I was working for Cisco at the time. First day I got in there at a keynote session with Steve Velovan. And he was talking about distributed DDoS attacks. So Steve Bellavan's up there talking about distributed DDoS attacks. I'm sitting there waking up, sitting next to Paul Ferguson. Some old timers know Paul. And Paul and I are sitting there. And all of a sudden, people started, pagers going off, and people started running out of the room, right? They were all running away <laughs> out the room. And Paul and I are going, like, what the hell's going on? Well, that's the DDoS attack that happened. 
the day after, I was late because I live in the San Jose area and dropping my daughter. My daughter was acting up, get, get the Nanog, and there was several people who sometimes were around here at Nanogs who were waiting for me. And they said, Barry, all, all the things you were doing at Cisco, stop. We want you to focus on how do we protect the backbone. Because all our bosses are upset. It's in the newspaper, you know, big internet outage and things like that. We have to figure out how to protect ourselves. And if we try to do firewalls everywhere, that's not how we build a network, right? So figure out how to do it where it doesn't break transit, doesn't break the principles of how we do things. So what you'll see through here is basically along that line. In other words, some of the techniques, like for instance, you know, using BGP as one of our most powerful security tools to protect the network against DDoS attacks is to a traditional security guy to go like, what do you mean you're using Forden to protect your network? He says, yes, of course. Because in networking, I, it's, it, I can control the flow of packets. Instead of putting big firewalls up there and try to brute force the stop of attack, I have it flow in the directions I want to go. Because I can control routing. So thinking, you know, it's a, it's a different paradigm. As a backbone engineer, thinking how do you protect yourself with Forden is versus a firewall ACL is a different mindset. So um, what evolved through there, and I'll explain how this all works up, is a community that started from 2000, a community started building up of service fire security professionals. And there's people who specialize in, in a whole area. There's actually um, ser uh, organized service providers now who have departments that are service fire security backbone engineers, which is different from your infosec guys. All right, so so that's actually evolved up that way. Um, so um, and they all people are working with each other. All right, um, everything we see out there on the net today, from a security standpoint, it's not internal AS; it's all inter AS. So collaboration is key. So you're going to hear me talk about sections about how the collaboration is key, how the the in this case the blue dot, right, and getting to know people and getting the PGP keys exchange and going out for dinner and lunches here at Nanog are important. That's why the, that blue dot is there because that that these relationships with your competitors, right, but really your peers, your fellow engineers, are critical, really critical to protecting your network, your business, right? There are a lot of security groups out there, and I'll mention this in, in the operational security module, that of these groups that evolved, there's specializations around these groups. We'll mention about that. Core thing you'll hear is NSPSEC. So tomorrow is a BOF. We call it the NSPSEC BOF, right? So NSPSEC is a group that is started in 2002 um, that um, is probably the core backbone-oriented group, right? And its primary job is to keep the packets flowing across the net and make sure the network isn't taken down from DOS attacks or malware and things like that. Um, it's not the only group out there, but it's very backbone-oriented focused. The NSPSEC BOF is pretty much every nanog. It's not taped. There are things said there that you don't want on record, right, <laughs> at times, because it's, it's designed that way to be that way. Um, and it's the place where if, to, to, if you are not on there, if your organization doesn't have a representative of NSPSEC, this is the place where you start getting to know people so you can get vetted in. It's an individual vetting system. In other words, it's designed to, to make sure that you're not a bad guy because <laughs> they don't want to have the bad guys in these communities. All right? And there's, there's uh, techniques to work with it. Um, the threat cycle, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about this threat cycle, this, this whole, we've noticed this kind of economic cycle. There was a, a colleague of mine, Rob Thomas, and I back in um, 99, we were noticing the economic cycles in security, and this is back when it was IBM, and then starting up Team Cumber, we noticed these economics, these waves, economic cycles happening with it. These, this is now called the criminal, cyber criminal economy, right? It's, it's huge, huge business, and I'll talk a bit about this, but these cycles would repeat. As they would repeat, what we would do in the service provider world is we would take time to work through a problem, and then as we work through the problem, we figure out what we need to do. And what we need to do is different as aspects of it. What we need to do happens from uh, new techniques, new best common practices, new protocols, new additions of protocols, new equipment. Right? So some of the things that would happen out there, there'd be responses within the vendors. Right? You talk to the Cisco, the Juniper, the Acatels, Lucens, these guys, they would have different things going on equipment. You look at ITF, that we do things there. 
right? So we would respond to it. So, so it hasn't been, we haven't been sitting on our hands, you know, uh, since 2000. There's been a lot of evolution going on, a lot of new techniques and approaches and stuff happening with equipment with it. Um, we've also been looking at certain um, principles, and I'll talk about these of like guiding things, like this, like, you know, like, like the Moore's Law, like, you know, Sean's, Sean Donnellan's, you know, observation when he worked at SBC, which it's funny because I hear quoted at Capitol Hill with federal policy people now, the 40-40-20 rule. Um, and this was an observation that he was monitoring patch rates across his customer base when SBC, before SBC got AT&T. And so, you know, this is, this is kind of like we're here, 40% of the customers care and will proactively patch. 40% of the customers, you have to poke them to patch, and then 20% of the customers don't do anything. They'll never patch because they don't know. Um, so what we are observing over time now is we're noticing these core, like the Moore's Law factor up there that doesn't change. So uh, we're also coming up with this different best common practices. So these 11, I'll walk through some of them today with them but and give you an introduction to each of them. And then uh, we get new ones out there. The, all these, these fundamentals are, are building blocks. Um, anybody here who's heard about clean pipes for DDoS protection and services like that, DDoS protection services, these fundamentals are how, what they're built upon. In other words, if you don't know how to do a remote trigger black hole, there's no way you want to do a remote trigger shunt right, into a sinkhole, which is essentially where you do a, a remote trigger shunt into a sinkhole is what you send over to a DDoS remediation service. Right? If you don't do a, know how to do a remote trigger black hole, you don't want to do an MPLS shunt. MPLS shunt is a technique where you redirect and across, across the backbone sort of work. Right? So, um, so these are kind of the fundamentals of it. And then, of course, knowing, knowing, the, uh, knowing the enemy now. So let me go to my next module here. And let's talk about understanding the threat. Um, so uh, this, um, what I'm going to walk through is talks about the criminal cloud, all right? Uh, and I'm going to kind of walk through where what the cr criminals out there do today. When somebody, you know, gets up, has a cup of coffee, and my job is to go out there to steal credit cards. Um, I don't break into a computer steal credit cards. I build infrastructure. I build what I call cloud infrastructure based off of different malware like SpyEye, Zeus, that I go buy from a criminal ecosystem that builds me tools and capabilities of, of having this malware that gets installed across computers across the net and allows me to build this big, very complicated infrastructure. The biggest cloud systems on the planet is criminal cloud systems. They're all over the place, right? And they're on your networks. They could be on your own infrastructure for your own service provider work. You can almost guarantee it, right? Because we spot it in our infrastructure, we'll spot it in your infrastructure. They're on your customer networks and enterprise networks. It's all over the place. And the reason why it's all over the place is the dirty little secret in the industry is antivirus doesn't work anymore, right? This is like virus totals. You take, you take malware samples that come into your spam trap and you load it up to a tool called Virus Totals, and you'll watch and you'll find that most of the stuff that comes into your, like, here's a, a little attachment, take the attachment, load the executable in Virus Totals, you'll find nothing detects it. Nothing detects it because what happens is these bad guys found out that there's these interesting little tools called packers that will go through and obfuscate, and any signature and heuristic way of detecting for a piece of a malware will get obfuscated. And I can automate this. So I set up where there's an automated way of going out there and packing the software. So that way there's no way for me, if, if, if there's a particular virus binary, I can set things up where there's, there's no two pieces of malware identical to each other. That every time I send it out that the malware that you receive and you receive and you receive in a spam run is actually different malware even though it's the same thing because I can obfuscate it. So how as an antivirus company can I go out there and check? The signature list would be so big that, uh, you know, that's, it's impossible to do. So, so what the bad guy does with this capability, that means that I can get through antivirus, I can get through the infection, then it's just a matter of me setting up the mechanics to get these tools on the computers and to take people out to actually click and install. How do I get somebody to click and install? 
So they have different systems out there. So here I'll walk through. Guy gets up in the morning, having a cup of coffee, says, okay, let's go to work. It's a day's work. And some of these guys that's interested is actually nine to fivers or less. You know, I could work for four hours a day, right? And they'll get up, and you can see the hours in which they go out there, go out there and run their tools and work, right? So, so here he gets up there and says, okay, I got a bunch of domains staged, right? So I got domains staged up there. So first thing I'm going to do is go up there and set one of my domains I got staged up. And these are weird domains, right? And maybe during the break I'll show off like passive DNS with some of these spam traps. They got weird, weird domains they do. But I'll, I'll stage up a domain for my spam run. And I got to get my malware all ready to go. So I'm, on my cloud, I'm going to stage my malware on my drive-by site. I'll have a couple of broken-in computers and hosting companies. And I'm going to stage up my malware. So, so, and I can use this over V6. What's interesting is we'll see guys playing around with using V6. As more V6 gets deployed, and because we don't have uh, NetFlow firewall detection sort of, you know, for doing V6, they know they can hide under the radar and use V6 as a way to obfuscate. So I'll go up there and load up my malware on my drive-by. Then I'm going to go and contract. So I'll go to one of my buddies' networks and I'll contract them. Says I want a spam run, and they have a nice, beautiful menu. All right, the stuff like in <laughs> it's in Russian. This menu I saw one time. It's like figure out what you want. Say first thing I do is says I want to say this, and it goes off to a translator service. The person will translate it into English of what you want to say and come in there for your spam, All right? And that's live. It's like a live thing. Type it in Russian. <laughs> Goes out to somebody. They come back in English. Boom. There's what I need in English. Now I cut and paste that into my tool. And I figure out what I want to do to the layout of the email for the spam, right? And load my graphics up, okay? And then say, okay, send out to this population. I figure out my population. So just like you go to like LinkedIn or Google and say, pick your population of what you want to send to, it's just like that. Here's what I want to spam to. Here's how much it costs you. Pay money. Pay money. Send it out. Boom. Spam. So that's an av that's avalanche. <laughs> Cut while. These are the guys who specialize in that. Their market is to sell them to criminals. So I'm going to go out there and say, okay, if I'm doing it today, what I'm going to do? I need people to click on something. Well, what's today? Super Bowl. <laughs> I'm going to target the United States and do a Super Bowl spam run. All right, let's get people out there. So. So now the spam run goes out there, gets into the victim of the crime, right? Person goes on there and clicks on this interesting Super Bowl thing. What happens is they're clicking or looking at it because we've seen things like, for instance, um, you know, they, zero days. There is, I, you know, there was a, a couple of years ago where there was a, uh, what became Java Patch 20 um, was basically being used live in the wild. And all you had to do is look at the site and they were be able to infect you. With a Java infection, there was nothing you can do. Up to date, up to date virus, up to date operating system, you know, Firefox with no script, and it still got into the system with a Torpeg Mebroot infection, right? So, so this stuff will go right through your 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 defensive mechanisms. Once it's on there, you shut down antivirus, you call up your secondary and load up, load up more malware, and that second malware goes through there and tells calls the controller and says, "Nice little report, right? This is this is some of the best network management." GUI I've seen was actually the criminal malware that reports what is on the machine, <laughs> right? Here's exactly what's on the machine. Here's what I just own. I now own this machine. What can I do with it? Now, if I'm a botnet herder, I will go out there and groom it and figure out, okay, I got a machine in the United States military space, so I'm going to groom these together and sell it to somebody and groom these over here and build little botnets and go up and sell them. So that's a botnet herder. If I'm part of a criminal gang, then I'll set these machines up for flash flux systems. If I'm a spam crew, I'm going to set it up for spam. If I'm going to go out there and say, I'm looking for, like, for instance, I'll look in here and say, you know, what applications are on it. And it may be like what banks. I may be looking for banks. I may be looking for companies, right, to do certain things. And the reason why I could do certain things is I could load up certain malware. So say I go in there and say, okay, the second malware I load up, I can say, okay, um, I can want to break into some place because this guy has a VPN access to some place special. Or I'm going to go out there and infect other computers inside of a network. Um, or I'm going to load it up with a proxy. And with a proxy, you know, they're, they're able to actually uh, sit there. Um, the, the Zeus Petrovich crew was able to um, basically, you log into your bank. And the criminal will be sitting there, and he'll get an alarm on the computer and says, the guy's logging into the bank now. 
he goes in there, oh, this is good. Sets it up where as you're logging in, you get this, you know, hourglass. Delay, 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 delay. What that really means is the guy has intercepted your session and is you type in your username and password, and the guy's going in there into your account while you're sitting there seeing the hourglass. You think the bank's web application's slow, but actually what's going on, the guy's in there doing a wire transfer of your money. And then let's go, and you look in your account, you go, hey, there's no money. <laughs> what happened? It was just stolen. This happened all over Europe. A lot of the banks in Europe, this is the big pain in a lot of European banks. Hasn't really hit the United States a lot here, but it's European banks has been hidden. You know, because the way they would do it is they click in there, and you know the SSL proxy through there, and then straight through, and get into, into a corporate network, right? Login network. So this is the infrastructure. This is on your networks. Everybody who runs a big backbone, cloud systems, service providers, residential hosting systems, it's on there, right? I can guarantee it's on there because it's because the defensive tools we have aren't working like we think they're supposed to work, right? So it's it's one of those things from a business perspective we have to be really mindful of and do something about. This is why I say civic society is asking us to do things. So the scary consequences of this is, for instance, people say, oh, security development life cycle and open you know, and code work, it's not working like we thought it was going to work. Um, the antivirus tools aren't working like we thought they're working, right? The uh, application security isn't delivering application security like we thought, right? The network security stuff, firewalls, IDPs. Well, where's the V6 parts of it, right? Um, the defense of death isn't working like we thought it was going to work. The malware remediation isn't working like we thought it was going to work, even though we're making better successes. This year is an interesting thing. We're making the better successes. And the bad guys follow equi equilibrium patterns. In other words, if you try to do something, the bad guys will change. They'll follow the money, right? As I'm talking about here, they follow money. And law enforcement isn't real, in a good position to do a lot, but they are doing a lot. We are making some good progress on this. So why I say all this is the, it's, it's a reality check to realize that it's pretty ugly out there. You don't read it in the popular press because if people realize how bad it was, people go like, oh my goodness, what are we doing? All right? Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of hope. A lot of hope and there's a lot of techniques that, that I'll talk about here do really help you increase the resiliency and security on your network. They do pan out. They do work out. Um, we are making a lot of progress from the law enforcement perspective. We're putting handcuffs on people. We're shutting down operations. Really good on the collaboration aspect of it. Right? So we're figuring out how to disrupt some of the ecosystems. So this is a 2012 I'll talk about as a year of hope. Year of hope. So some of the things to understand on this is what happens with these bad guys. There's behavior problems, behavior things to look at. So one of the things that we'll talk about here is we'll talk about a lot of techniques. But when it comes to the bad guys, um, one of the, the, the problems that was persistent for years in the security community is we talked about the malware. Right? Who cares? It's like if I was a drug enforcement agent and I want to talk about the chemical composition of the methamphetamines, they'll go like, who cares? I want to know about who's making it, who's selling it, who's distributing it. It's the people. Right? Malware don't commit crime. The people who use the malware commit crime. Malware doesn't damage your network. It's the people who use the malware that damages your network. Right? So we got to remember that the target is not the malware, the botnets, and things like that. The target are the people. So, for instance, one of the things that you'll hear more about, because I know I'm going to help uh, advertise it more, is um, there was a couple of us um, at a meeting three years ago that said, hey, why wait for law enforcement? We can sue people in the corporate world. And Microsoft actually raised their hand and stepped up and started doing it. Right? So they said, ah, Walladeck. <laughs> Here is the infrastructure, because we can find the infrastructure. We can see this cyber criminal infrastructure. And then he went out there and said, here's where it's located at, went to court, and basically said, this infrastructure is causing all this damage, and we're going to sue them, whoever's behind it, John Doe. We don't know who it is, but it's John Doe, and this is their infrastructure. We're going to sue you, because it's on your network. We're going to sue you to say that computer is confiscated. It's now our asset. And and you, the Microsoft goes in front of a judge, and the judge says, okay, where's the defendant? Where's Mr. John Doe, who supposedly owns these computers? Ah, they don't show up. Okay, fine, Microsoft, you got it. <laughs> it's all here. It shut it down. 
right? So, so there's, um, so you can go, that's Microsoft saying, let's go after the people. And that's something we want to get more companies to do. If they touch your network, the bad guys touch your network, you can sue them. Even if you don't know who they are, right? That's the way business law works. So we can do that. We can go after, forget the gun, figure out, so somebody, somebody's pulling the trigger. I don't know who that is, but let's sue whoever. I can see where the gun's at. I can see where the malware's at. I can see where the drive-by's at. I can see that. So let's go up there and, and shut those things down, right? And it's, it works. This is how capitalism works. And the reason why this is attractive is because this is how we see the world, laws, borders, things like that. But in cyberspace, you know, it's, it's like this, <laughs> right? So how do we get around international legal issues? You use corporate law, you use civic law versus criminal law, right? So this is where I say one of the areas of hope is, is you can use civic society push back with the law enforcement part, part of it. So major threats. I break the threats into three big categories, criminal threat, cyber warfare threat, and then the anarchist, the anonymous guys, right? And I'm going to focus on the criminal threat here, right? So you guys understand it from a behavior standpoint. But of the three things on here, the things that kind of worry me, keep me up late at night, is um, the anarchist one. Those are the ones that keep me really up at night. Cyber warfare doesn't worry about. I don't worry about cyber warfare. The reason I don't worry about cyber warfare is if you're a soldier and you're a cyber warfare soldier, I'm your general. <laughs> I tell you what to do, right? They have somebody, you know, there's a command and control. It's a state policy issue. If you had a cyber war going on, it's kind of beyond my pay grade, right? Even though I remind lots of people who are military in uniform that, um, you know, they can't tell, uh, you know, AT&T that I'm going to use your network as a battlefield. AT&T is going to say, well, wait a minute, I have contracts with customers. I can't allow that to happen, right? It's not like the same sort of thing out there with cyber warfare. So I don't worry about cyber warfare. But the, this down here, the patriot, passionate, principled people, um, those, those are the ones that, that work with it. Um, as I mentioned before, we've seen certain principles, principles that we can actually, you know, use to govern how we decide do things in our network. Um, and these are the principles where you call the basically the seven habits of highly effective cyber criminals, right? So instead of seven habits of highly effective people, this is cyber criminal success patterns. And this is what you would do. So I'll go through these really quick. Number one, don't get caught. Very simple, don't get caught. And it's funny, you'll see this. You'll see vulnerabilities that come out from Microsoft, and you'll see um, some exploit. You look at the exploit, and you think of how they would use the exploit. And if I'm doing an exploit, and I connect to your system, and I have to sit there and do things on your system, see I'm connected to your system for a while, right? there's a high chance that you'll watch and spot me and trace back. If there's a high chance that any exploit, any vulnerability, if there's a chance I would get caught, right? The bad guys, the criminals, will stay away from it. Don't get caught. Don't put handcuffs on me, right? But there, if they can do things that they don't get caught, really high chance. So anytime I look at a vulnerability, there's an exploitability. I look at it, and the exploitability is basically on um, whether the guy can get caught or not. All right. If it's something that they're going to get caught, they probably won't see it in a while. If something they they won't get caught with it, then we'll see it all over the place. Second thing is don't work too hard. Cyber criminals are lazy, right? Let me make money with least amount of work, right? If they have to do a lot of work to break into a system, ah, ain't worth it. There's much more easier ways of doing it. Follow the money. It's really funny. In my Cisco days, there was an EBC session, and there was uh, six executives from this one big service provider, and they weren't believing me that I was telling them they need to do more about security on the network. And I said, okay, look, guys. Here, here's a note. It's an extortion note. This is why you guys are not having the threat right now. Here's an extortion note. The extortion note says within four hours, all right, you're going to send $10 million to the Swiss bank account. Now, me, Barry Green, knows your network, right, and I know how to take you down, right? It's not hard to figure out how to take down a service provider. It's really pretty easy to learn how to take down a service provider, okay? And I know how to take you down. They said, well, well, how would you do that? And they quickly went to the whiteboard. Here, I'll use this technique. And they went, oh, yeah, that would work. So it's okay. Now, here's a problem. All you guys are big executives. How do you move $10 million over that big account? Think now. 
How do you move $10 million like this? And they're all sitting around looking at me. It's like, yeah, exactly. You can't pay the vendor on time. <laughs> We're the vendor. You can't pay us on time, let alone figuring out how to do like some work order to send money across. You're a big bureaucracy. The bad guys know that. You're no, there's no money in it for going after an extort in the service provider. No money. Yet. All right? When they figure out how to get money out of you, they go after you. And that's essentially the core principle of cybercrime. Cybercrime will follow a money pattern. If they figure out how to get money out of you, they'll go after you. So just because you're not getting hit doesn't mean you're not vulnerable. It just means they haven't figured out how to get money off of you. All right? And that's a core thing I emphasize over and over again. Because this is something that will happen to you as backbone providers, as cloud providers, is if they can't take out, like if you're the one with the money, right, and you put up big defenses, says, okay, and he's your provider, says, okay, I'll go after him to get to you. Because I'm being paid as a hitman. My job is to take out your network. I'm going to do a, a DDoS for hire. And if you got big defenses on, then I'll go upstream, right, I'll flow up. And we see that happen. Um, trying to capture these guys, trying to prosecute these guys is multi-jurisdictional. We thought this would be a big problem. What's interesting is over the last two years especially, we've gotten really good international law enforcement, right? This last DNS changer uh, takedown where we had three different countries involved uh, with uh, evidence, putting evidence in, three, in courts in three different countries was actually pretty significant. So we're making some progress, some interest in progress here, multi-jurisdictional, but the bad guys will keep multi-jurisdictional. They they'll do it in many different countries and make it harder for us. And they'll try to go after people who won't prosecute. So this is where we say, okay, let's go out there and sue them. Let's do it, go after it and sue them. Let's retaliate with it, right? Because for years they've been going after people who don't do it. And they'll also stay below the pain threshold. Um, in 2004, the industry, we started doing a big effort to stop big DDoS attacks. And what happened there was the criminals noticed that if my DDoS attack went above a certain threshold, the service providers responded. And then they dropped the threshold, and they dropped the threshold, and dropped the threshold. So now, especially in North America and Europe, we don't see a lot of big DDoS attacks because the service providers wake up and do something about it. So they figured out that threshold. And the cyber criminals figure out what those thresholds are, and they respond to it. So that's a DDoS example. Another threshold example they look at is uh, acceptable loss ratio. In 2000, when I started in service our security, I talked to Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo's acceptable loss ratio, ratio before they actually opened a criminal case for a, you know, online banking fraud was $150. Today, it's $1,500. In other words, there's so much of it that the threshold goes up and up and up and up because if it kept it at a little threshold, there'd be so much of it that they, their, their abuse department would just be buried, right? The bad guys know exactly where those thresholds are at. Give an example, a Carter operation. Carter operation is where I got a stolen credit card and I'm going to pay a secret shopper so you're a teenager. Yeah. Secret shopper, here's a secret shopper and your job is to go out here and say, here's your shopping list and here's a white credit card, it's actually a piece of white credit card, and go around to these stores and buy these things. And it will total up to the acceptable loss threshold of that credit card. So it's funny, um, a year and a half ago, my wife's card got hit, $4,999. Chase card, exact, $4,999. 16 different stores in the Miami area. Chase, because I know the abuse guys at Chase, Chase acceptable loss threshold was $5,000. In other words, that's where the alarm triggers that the card's being used for criminal activity and shuts down the card automatically. $5,000, $4,999, zero cents, exact, on there. These guys know this stuff. <laughs> they understand the network stuff, so they stay below the threshold. These guys also have a certain set of trust with them. This whole ecosystem has a trust, but then they go after each other. In other words, sometimes the collateral damage we'll see on the net is because two, two bad gang gangs don't trust each other to start attacking each other. So some of the dot, uh, DNS amplification attacks that we've seen over the last two years has been, you know, bad guys going after each other, All right? There's also dial consequences. When Slammer happened, we had two people killed in Korea because uh, there was a collateral damage issue and the DNS system in Korea went down, so Korea was off the net. 
and they had these um, uh, gambling, you know, gaming parlors because online gaming is a big thing, and people like like a lot of money into uh, uh, gangs, the cyber, uh, the, not the gangs, but the actual physical gangs in Korea kind of really control a lot of the gaming that goes on there, the video gaming stuff, and you have these guys that go around and collect the money, and uh, you know you had uh, two gambling parlors, the guys who ran it, they, they you know said, well, there's, the internet's down, I can't, I don't make any money. And so they made an example of them because the thugs who collect the money don't know anything about DDoS attack. They just know I can't get my money. They make an example. So you know they kill one guy, go to the next place. Oh yeah, yeah, here's the money, <laughs> right? It's 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 bad bad news with it. Um, and these these extortion things like that, these are going to be here to stay. These this ecosystem stuff, right? These are slides you can look at later on. It shows like ecosystem of all these things, um, you know. Of different specialization and middleman with it, you know they follow certain cycles and patterns. These patterns increase over time. But one of the things we're going to see in 2012 is this. Um, I'm going to, you know, what homework sort of thing for everybody. I'm going to ask people to do is go look at the uh, Norton uh, Cyber Survey, the Cyber Survey from 2011 that came out in September. Um, this is one of the new wave of things that's really promising. Because what is going on is they're starting to monetize what's happening. They're trying to monetize the loss. And this loss threshold right here, all right, is higher than drug and human trafficking combined. So when you look at the crime activities in the planet, and when you total up cybercrime as being higher than illegal drug and human trafficking combined, we're starting to get publicly information out that we knew privately behind the scenes in the law enforcement world, that we knew that the cybercrime threat was a huge loss in society. Now, what's going to happen over 2012 is more surveys like this will happen. So Semantic kind of raised the bar about how to do these surveys. So we're going to get more of these coming out. What will then happen is towards the end of the year, those companies that insure your networks, right? who insure you against cyber threat, are you going to start saying, hmm, what are you guys doing to protect your network? Capitalism will kick in because these the way we protect, like for instance, you don't see like theft of property as a big high thing is because for you to protect your physical property for like, you know, look at this right here. See this right here? This is a lockdown device on this projector. This lockdown device on this projector is because this hotel or the AV service who's providing this thing over here probably has insurance, and that insurance says, are you doing your due diligence to make sure that nobody walks out with this protector? That's how capitalism works. That's how business works. You know, This company puts that protective device on there. That's the same thing that's going to happen on networks. That's why I'm being asked to actually dust off these materials and start investing in these materials again, because this is what's going to happen. These surveys are probably going to be the biggest dynamic that will come down where your management will come down and say, hey, we got to do something about cybersecurity because the insurance company is asking us, what are we doing? We got to have a report. What are we doing? What's the list? And off we go doing the list. Um, we do got some good actions out there. Community action makes an impact. Um, this is something where, where we took down the uh, Mokolo operation. And, but the thing is, the criminals respond, right? So we take these guys down. They learn their lessons, they improve, and they come back better because there's a big economic drive for them to do things, right? So that's the cyber criminals. What, what do we do? What do we do when these guys pop up? And again, cyber warfare, if it happens, you know, it's above our pay grade, you know? They're going to try to use your network as a, as a warfare zone. And then you'll have to think about your management, have to think about, well, what do we do if somebody wants to use our backbone as a warfare zone? protect our customers or do national interest. And that's going to be interesting choices that people have to do, especially multinationals. So cyber warfare consequences is, you know, it hits backbones. You know, that's, this is the battle space. Your backbone is the battle space. Do you want to have that happen? Right? And be prepared for it because, you know, it does, does you know, do you want to have the collateral damage on, on, your, on, your, on your network? Right? Um, but the threat I really worry about these guys People who don't have a political affiliation, they don't have bosses, they're not driven by money, they just want to do it because there's something that they believe in, whatever that is. Right? The first crew that I saw out there that was really passionate about this is the Chinese threat. 
A lot of times the Chinese threat where China is attacking someplace isn't China. It's people in China. Now, when you have a half of a million hackers and they interact with each other and they compete with each other and they're very patriotic, <laughs> right? Um, I was in China one time um, back in 2005 and the, the um, Japanese government came up with their new textbook, right? And it downplayed the Nanking Massacre because they didn't call it a Nanking Massacre, they called it a Nanking Incident on the World War II history. And people in China are very passionate because they call it, it was a Nanking Massacre. And there was a huge, there was a 120 gig DOS attack that was taken down the transoceanic link between Japan and China. Because these, and it wasn't the Chinese government. As a matter of fact, I was in China Telecom and we were working to stop it. The Chinese government wanted to stop it. It wasn't the government. It wasn't China Telecom. It was a lot of, you know, a half a million dollars, a half a million really good hackers who were very mad and very patriotic because they didn't like it. How do you stop them? <laughs> right? This is the anonymous crew. It's people like that. Those are, those are people who will, who controls them? Yes, Warren. <laughs> Yes, somebody moved a statue. And there was people who were mad, who were Russian, who didn't like the statue being moved. <laughs> right? There's no control. Right? So this is, this is um, you know, the cyber crime, as I talked about, they follow certain principles. It's bad. It's a lot of risk. But they follow criminological principles. You can learn this from the FBI and other governments. Right? So we, we can figure out how to do something about it. We are doing something about it. Cyber warfare, you got a general in charge. These guys, the anonymous crew, all right, go back with the, you know, the anonymous crew icon. These, these guys down here, <laughs> there's no control. They'll just do stuff. And that's what keeps me up because there's no predictability with this threat, right? So um, are you part of civic society? And we'll talk about that in, in a session coming up. So let me now get through to, let's talk about some of our toolkit. So all this with the threat out there, we got to be able to do something. So let's talk about doing something, all right? Um, there are 10 of the now 11 techniques because with the remediation one where we believe so strongly that we're going to have to get more providers. There's enough providers out there doing remediation where that's just helping to clean up that it's enough where there's best common practices that we're pulling out. We got now a, a uh, internet draft that's coming out with practices. So I'll walk through, these are, I'm going to take selections for this tutorial, I'm going to take selections of different parts of it, all right? So there's a module in here we'll talk about, about the importance of preparing your network operations center. In other words, you can't wait until the last minute to do any sort of preparation. You have to think about it now. So all of you being here at this session is part of the preparation. This is really, really important. You got to invest in it because um, it's just like a fire department, right? You don't want to... The analogy I use is you go, go to the fire, you know, and what do you do? Open up the manual. How do you operate the fire truck? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> right? You got to know, you got to have the tools ready to go and you got to be prepared for it. So like this process right here, which, which um, you know, I'll, I'll walk through here when we talk about the prepare to knock is something that you evolved in the industry with it. Um, collaboration is key. You got to collaborate with your peers. You being here in Nanog is part of this. So I'm really happy you guys are here. And then, you know, take advantage, all, all of you who are brand new, of you getting to know people. You know, look for people around and, you know, I'll introduce you around. You'll be, you'll be uh, amazed. All you need to do is go up there and ask people. Come up and ask them. You know, look. If you see the black dot or the blue dot, right here, the blue dot, you go up and see the blue dot, just go up and introduce yourself. Hey, all right, 1280, AS, all right, what do you guys do? What do you do? What do you work on? Ask questions. Hey, I work on this. Start getting to know. Exchange business cards, emails, PGP keys, right? All that stuff, right? Do all that stuff. Um, and that goes a, a big, long way to, to collaborate with it. Um, another is the tool set. Um, this is, um, I mean, I still use this today. I knock VBA. We got our own phone system. It was funny, during the middle, in the middle of Slammer in 2003, this is a, um, a SIP-based phone system based off autonomous system number. Uh, unfortunately, I never changed my phone number. So if you dial 109-100, it goes to my phone, which is 109 Cisco. I never changed it, though. I need to change it. <laughs> I need to log in and change it. So um, uh, PCH kind of puts that whole thing together and manages with it. And it was a demonstration of what we can do with a private system. The idea is, is can I have a private bat phone, 
Um, so you had two phones on your desk. One phone was your corporate phone. The other phone was like the bat phone. If you know the bat phone rang, then it was somebody important that was one of your peers. It was a self-selecting sort of stuff, right? You know, it wasn't an irate customer. Um, protecting your network is really key. Scanning your network, looking at your network uh, um, constantly with it because the bad guys are probing your network. I mean, simple things, um, well, we'll talk about here because I'm not doing this module, but simple things still apply. Um, I remember in 2000, in preparation, um, there was, I did a nano class in 99, and these guys from CNN, uh, they listened to the class and they liked the technique, and the technique was very, very simple. Basically, they uh, put on the VTY access list, because they were using Cisco's, and the same thing works with Juniper. Um, but basically, on the access list, they put two log statements in. So basically, any time they had a failure, they logged TCP and logged IDP, right? And they, and they pump that into syslog, so it goes into their syslog for the entire site, and they load that into MRTG, right? And so they had a graph that showed the log failures on the VTY ports every day, right? So they had this threshold. And people are scanning your network. So something as simple as that. So that's like syslog MRTG, <laughs> right? And they had these scripts going, and three weeks before the 2000 um, elections, it spiked. I mean, it went up by 600%, right? And they were like, holy cow, what's that mean? It means we're going to, somebody's really probing our network. They're really probing our network. Probing our network, what's the compelling event? Elections coming up. Who are we? We're CNN. Oh, two and two <laughs> equals four. They're going to attack us during the elections. Let's prepare. And they prepared. And by golly, that was the elections with Florida and all that stuff, right? So CNN was not only everybody going to CNN trying to figure out who's the president, right, with Gore and Bush. They were also being attacked, and they kept the site up and running because that's something as simple as, you know, preparing their infrastructure and then monitoring the infrastructure with a simple syslog and, and MRTG gave them insight of what's happening, right? So some of the techniques that we teach in this, this broad curriculum is as simple as that, right? You set that up, you, gotta, you should be collecting syslog anyways. That's add one script to syslog, plug in an MRTG, and you keep an eye on it. What's the level of scans on my network? You're always going to get scanned, but what is the level of scans? And look for the variance in there. If you all of a sudden you see variances, something's going on. Edge protection. Protecting your network. I mean, you know, and this goes everywhere from ranging from, you know, ACLs on the edge of your network to core hiding techniques. You know, there's a range of different things you, you, you uh, need to consider depending on your network scenario and even to different sections of your network. Because you could have certain sections of the network you want to protect differently than other sections of the network depending on services and capabilities and things like that. You know, um, I was talking to one, one uh, crew and they say, oh, yeah, um, all our video and voice services are totally isolated. None of the internet traffic can get to it. So this is like they have an edge protection policy for the common backbone infrastructure, and then within the voice and video services, it's even more protected. So it's, you know, layers internally. So, but, you, you know, constantly think through it. And it's interesting, some of the techniques we would use with this are not just like throw ACLs everywhere. It's like how you actually forward your packets, how you address your network, you know, because you can address and forward packets inside of a network in such a way where you're just using the separation between EGP and IGP as a protection mechanism, right? There's, there's a reason why many networks would use IS to IS as an IGP is because IS to IS is not IP, <laughs> right? It's a different protocol. And a different protocol actually gives you some protection mechanisms, right? Because you can't attack the IGP if it's an IP externally as an example. So that's like an example of equations you would go through from edge protection, which is non-intuitive, right? Your IGP selection as part of your edge protection is not really a, a traditional security way of doing it, but you understand how it works with backbone work. Um, Destination-based remote trigger black hole, and then the source-based remote trigger black hole, which I'll talk about both uh, here and in, 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 um, uh, after the break. So remote trigger black hole, this is probably the number one tool that we use in our toolkit. How many people here have remote trigger black hole set up in your network ready to go? Yay, this is great, all right? <laughs> Remember the first time that Chris Morrow and I and Chris Gremlin were like, come on, get everybody doing it. It was really, um, I mean, this is a really, really 
This is a tool I have ready to go on a network. There's been times where um, a customer has had a DOS attack, and in the middle of the DOS attack, we configured across the network. Um, the, uh, and I'll mention, mention this, you know, you can, you can set this up and deploy it across backbones with like zero, zero chance of something happening on your network. You just set it all up and be ready to go. And then when you need it, it's just a powerful technique. The core thing with this is we're using Forden as a core tool, right? Once you've got this set up, you can do other things with it. You can do other things instead of just dropping the packets on the edge and set things in L0. You can do things like, let's shut it over here to the sinkhole, or let's send it over here to this cleanup device, or let's send it around. Because as I mentioned before, the backbone security, a lot of it is instead of just throwing ACLs and firewalls or something, we're just forwarding packets where we want it to go. Right? It's, it's, a, it's a mind shift. It's like in martial arts, there are hard styles where you use force against force, and there are soft styles where you redirect the flow of energy. Backbone security is soft styles. You're redirecting the flow of energy to where you want it to go. Here's a packet. I control where it flows. It flows here. It flows there, wherever you want it to flow. And this is the foundation technique um, for, for doing it all. It allows you to do things where, from the knock, one command with BGP as a trigger, triggers across my network, and then send it to null zero. Or I can send it to a sinkhole. Sinkholes are probably one of the biggest uh, breakthroughs in forensics capability that we have on the net. The concept wasn't like um, astronomical or new. Um, we first started deploying them during Code Red. So the actual term sinkhole came out of when Code Red started up and it was really hitting New Zealand first and they happened to be in um, Singapore at the time and I'm with a whole bunch of the guys from New Zealand and we're trying to figure out how to handle Code Red and I said, well, why don't we take it down here and, and set it up to a, put an Ethernet switch on and do a static MAC on the Ethernet switch And because the routers couldn't drop the packets fast enough, so we forward the packets over. Now, that was not a, um, a, a astronomical great technique. That's actually, anybody here ever use AG, um, AGS Plus? How many old farts, right, AGS Plus? You ever do the uh, T connector? on the AUI and forward packets to the T connector AUI with a static Mac because if you try to filter packets, it, the AGS plus would just like die on you and that was a shunt <laughs> so to a sinkhole, right? And so that's essentially what, what we're doing here with the ethernet switch with the sinkhole. So that's where this whole concept, because, and we're saying, well, what do you call this? I said, well, we're shoving it down the toilet, down the sinkhole, and that's where <laughs> we're shoving the packets down the toilet. Since then, um, these, these things, and I'll talk about this, have grown to where in, uh, basically a principle is instead of just dropping the packet, I look at it first and drop it. Backscatter is part of this whole thing. You can stick um, you know, honey nets and honey pots in this thing. You can do um, the advertisements out of the sinkholes. So instead of having um, block, lock up your null zeros on your routers, so they go, I mean, you know, you take your, your slash 19. Instead of locking it up, so you do your BGP lockup, instead of just locking it up, make it equal null zero, you make it equal to sinkhole. So any packet that's scanning the network, it goes into a sinkhole and you count it. It gives you forensic capability. All right? So these sinkhole capabilities are pretty phenomenal of, of what they can do uh, with it. Uh, BCP38, we still need a lot of source address validation with it. And um, uh, through this year, um, you know, I promise people that I will be dusting off and it's time for a BCP38 review because um, there is more than just source address uh, of the IP nature that we need to look at, but we also need to look at other capabilities. There's other things to look at with it, right? Because any time a packet comes into your backbone, you, right, it's an AS boundary. You're an autonomous system. Autonomous system means that you have autonomy. You can dictate what comes in and set up a policy and what you accept and don't accept. So for instance, if you want to accept people to set their DACP uh, bit to whatever they want, set that policy. But if you want to say, I want to reset it to zero because I'm going to use that for QoS inside my network, then reset it to zero, right? So you can, you can you make those policies and then enforce those policies with it. Um, and it starts with this source address to make sure that the source address that gets sent to you comes from the source that says that this is that this is them. Same thing with a the MAC address, MAC address validation with it, right? 
BGP prefix filtering. Now, of course, there's lots of talk about you know um, the BGP security work and things like that, but there is a ton of stuff you can do now with the BGP that's available now. And don't wait for like, oh, we're going to get BGP security with the new protocol and things like that because where, when that comes out or where that comes out, it's, it's still the future. Talking about today, there's a whole bunch of things that you can do now that help protect your network and reduce your risk. I remember there's times where people who have been doing good BGP security techniques right out of the best common practices, good prefix filtering, and then in things that happen on the net and it doesn't bother them because they've been doing the things they need to do to protect themselves, right? Total visibility. Really, really understand what's happening in the network. Um, you know, one of the first things I did when in 97 when I went from Singapore Telecom over to Cisco Systems was NetFlow was getting killed. And I went like, oh, no, 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 can't kill NetFlow. <laughs> and so that was one of the first, first things I did at Cisco was to save NetFlow because I'm a big, big, big on visibility, right? And some people are very happy with the NetFlow part, um, you know, and the whole work with it because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data guy. I love, I, love, I love seeing the data and things like that with it. But I, it didn't start from a security perspective. It started from, like, me just understanding what the users are doing, marketing people. Salespeople need to understand what the executives, they need to know what the, what the users are doing. So this is the total visibility is one of those multiple use principles. And then uh, me coming out of the research world and going to Singapore Telecom, that was a thing that was drilled into me as basic principles from a monopoly telco. Understand exactly what the customers are doing. Bef know more what the customers are doing better than they know what they're doing. And then you can sell better to them, right? So this is like a surprising thing because you go like mobile carriers. Anybody here from mobile companies, right? Data, data, data. Know what your customers are doing. Data, data, data. Visit total visibility, right? And so that's what I was taught. And you know, demand that from your vendors, but also in the general IP world, really understand what's going on with it because you can use it. If you understand what's going on, then you can say, okay, what's the security angle of that data set? How can I use it from a security angle standpoint, right? So you can see what happens with it. And then the final one here, this is the kind of like the new one, which is remediation. We can see where the malware is happening on the networks. And, and you'll see a certain phrase I use in here all the time. I don't call it customers who are infected because the public health model is not communicating to you or your bosses or your management what's going to happen to civ with civic society. It's not a public health issue. It's a criminal issue. It's victimization. You've got customers who have been victimized. Customers have been violated because that's what these guys are doing, the criminal aspect. The malware goes on the system, and the system has been violated and victimized, right? It's a criminal aspect of it. Now, if you go out there and you see somebody on the street and the car getting broken into, and you walk by, right, and you could do something about it, like call somebody and say, hey, this car got broken into. What do you do? And that's the sort of role that we have with, with, with the remediation part. We're at a point right now where we can see our customers getting affected. We have to figure out ways, and there's enough ways out there that is cost effective. There's enough cost effective ways out there that work that go out there and remediate, and, that, and we'll talk about that part. So let's go to our next one. So putting these tools together, I'm going to walk through. Here's a DOS attack scenario. So it's always good to see these tools and see how they all fit together. So here's a DOS attack, right? So number one, um, a DOS attack. Think of it as an SLA violation, <laughs> right? And you laugh at that, but that was actually a breakthrough at one company. One company realized, oh, it's an SLA violation. That means I can go out there and set a threshold. That means anytime there's a DOS attack, it's an SLA violation. I can use that to measure security to justify for my security expenditure and keep the security department employed. Because if they're not there, then there's nobody to actually maintain the SLA levels, right? And you laugh at that, but that's actually how they justified it, right? So rent a botnet. There's all these botnets for hire, things like that, to do DOS attacks out there, to go out there and do it. But think of this. It's all about the packet. Once a packet goes into the internet, there's a core principle. All right, that packet needs energy to either drop it or to deliver it. Somebody's going to spend the energy to drop it. Somebody's going to spend the energy to deliver it. 
the energy is always going to be expended. As soon as the packet leaves my system, right, if I got a cell phone like on my iPhone here and I send a packet off from this guy over here, somebody's going to spend the energy to either drop that packet or deliver that packet. The energy is going to be expended, right? So whenever packets go into the system, somebody's got to do something. Somebody's, somebody's paying for it somehow in some way, right? So in here, there's this six principles that we, we, we've developed over the years. This actually, um, um, he's around here. So he actually asked me to do a session, Tony Talbert, because he's on a program committee. I says, Barry, we, we're, the program committee asked you to kind of do this session again, several providers. Um, five of these techniques are actually from Tony, <laughs> right? Because at the time he was at BBN, and then the 2000 attacks I told you about, um, you know, I asked the people who were hit like Yahoo and stuff and say, uh, which of the backbone providers did a good job? And um, they all pointed at Tony and BBN. And I was debriefing Tony doing a post-mortem. And he actually says, well, you know, I did the preparation. He had this actual NetFlow command that nobody knew because you know, the guy who coded NetFlow uh, did this command and left the next day and sent Tony the, the command and didn't document it. So Tony was the only one who knew the command existed in iOS. And Tony wrote a script around it. And so he prepared his system with that command. And then um, he set up and says, yeah, I used the command with NetFlow and did the identification with it. And then I kind of classified what the attack was. And then I traced it back to the stuff and I threw the ACLs in. And I wrote that down. I said, oh, wow, that's interesting. And then, um, uh, you know, several months later, I'm reviewing this with Chris Morrow, who was at UUNIT at the time, and, and he goes like, oh, oh you forgot the postmortem part. So this approach of how do you work an attack, uh, Tony and then Chris added the postmortem part, has been what we've been uh, using as a, a approach. Now, this isn't the only sort of methodology, but when we teach people who are brand new to, like, how do I respond to attack, it's always good to have a method, right? So you say, okay, what's the first thing? I got a DOS attack. What's the first thing I got to do? Well, hopefully you prepare it. So if you prepare it, then you say, okay, what's going on with the flow? Let's classify what's happening, what type of attack it is, all right? Let's figure out where it's coming from on my network, internal, external, things like that, and let's do something about it. And then remember afterwards, I got to do the improvements with it. All right, so sit rep. So here's a sit rep. Everything's normal, all right? Then the alarms go off. Something's happening, all right? So customer being DDoSed. Right, so the customer is being attacked over here, and it's com coming on. I got alarms going on, but I also got collateral damage because the attack is big enough that it's saturating the links going to the pop. Right, so now I got collateral damage. So it's not just one customer being hit that I can write out the attack; it's multiple customers being hit. Right, so what do I do with it? Right, so now I got multiple customers down here being hit. Right, so. Scenario number one, I gotta mitigate the collateral damage. All right? So collateral damage, right, is what I'm trying to prevent because it's not so much a target. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to push the attack to the edge because I identified that here's the particular customer being attacked. I'm gonna drop that to the edge. So I'm gonna take no trigger black hole, I'm gonna drop it to the edge of my network. All right? So now on the edge of my network, it's all being dropped on my edge of my network. So now I've taken what is an aggregate effect because all the packets coming to the target, hitting the pop, aggregates together. So I got a big flow. Now I'm pushing out to the edge of my network. I got fewer flows. In other words, the flows out here are less of than if they summed up down, down here. So I'm just pushing out. So now what I got is my collateral attack is, is mitigated. I got partial service all right, for my customer because um, one IP address is being hit. right? He had a slash 24 for an example. So one IP address on a slash 24, you know, is um, taken care of. So I do a slash 32, right? So I got partial service. The DOS attack is still active. And so now I go through and say, okay, what do I got to do now? Now I, I take the next step. I can sync call it. I can watch a DDoS attack. I can activate clean pipes, right? So I can go and do a community-based approach. In other words, you know, you can use communities to say only filter internal versus external, right? Or filter on these peers versus these peers. So I can actually take, take my, my black hole and say, okay, let me let's do this community filter and do this section. Let's do East Coast United States versus West Coast. Let's kind of see, or just international versus, and I can see where the attack is coming from. Give me some forensics with it. Um, so here, I, as I monitor it, I decide that I, I monitor it and use community-based and 
filter over in this one versus the other ones. I can shove it into a sinkhole, in a sinkhole, which I'll talk about here in a minute. I got a whole bunch of things in here. I got like, you know, analyzers, snippers, things like that. So I can analyze the attack, what's happening with it, and see what's going on with it. Um, the attack is still active. And then the customer is the victim, is the clean pipes, and I go to a full service recovery. I go in and throw it in there with a clean pipes term. So clean pipes, by the way, um, is essentially a, a marketing term that came up with uh, doing a DDoS remediation. It came up with uh, Cisco Guard Days, Arbor still uses it, some of the other companies use it. And the idea is, is take the whole t attack through a box that, that basically does selective filtering to clean out all the bad stuff out of it and get full service with it. So that's some ideas with it. So that's, that's kind of like a tool, a typical tool uh, kit approach of how to use the different ones. And so now we're going to jump into dive into some of the the modules. So first one on there that we have, prepare your knock. Um, core principle. Um, you need somebody in your in your team if you don't have it now who works on security. So how many people here have security the service provider backbone security departments? Anybody service provider security backbone departments? We got a few people in here, right? How many people here? have their knocks as the primary security guys. Just network operations center, right? Both models work. But make it somebody's job. I've seen it, it work very effectively where the knock guys do it, very effectively where you have your own specialist, very effectively when you have a security operations center. You know, it, the idea is just to identify who, who does it, right? Um, and anybody who uh, is in a knock should have an idea of the basic techniques because if you can have a knock guy and they can see something going on, they're first responders, right? So they need to know, like, okay, when do I use a remote trigger black hole? When do I shove it into a sinkhole? When do I throw some other tool in front of it, right? So it's important to actually have them prepare. Um, so, uh, you know, your operations team could be an escalation team. It could be a sister to a knock. There's, Different ways of doing it, and I've seen all the different ways successful, depending on the organization. Um, having a policy around it, you know, and having a, a practice, and having a sit down, and whether it's just a beer, we talk about how we work the attack, because some people will be like that. To actually having a, a tabletop war games, you know, where they're doing tabletop exercises, or getting into a lab and trying things out in the lab. The key thing is to prepare and to talk it through before it happens. Where I see the mistakes in the industry happen is where there has been no time or, or preparation done, no investment preparation, and then the stuff happens, and then you have longer outages than you should. The big successes I've seen is when an operation actually did some work, at least, even a little bit ahead of time, and then an incident happens, they say, sure, here's what we do, and they shut the attack down, and they keep the services up and running. Um, but the key thing is, is, is preparation. Um, the fire department analogy, I think, is the key, you know, key one I've used over the years to emphasize the point, you know, is where a operator will go through and, and oh, wow, there's a fire. What do I do? Okay, open up the manual. <laughs> That's not what a fire department does. You, you know, you train, you train, you train with it to get ready. So um, on the you know on the job training as you do with it. Um, this approach, to the, the six phases approach, the preparation part. Um, the first part, the preparation, is, is this is part of the preparation. Getting the tools, the techniques, being familiar with it. And then after this, if, if, you, if you see some of these techniques and say, I want to do it, then go ahead and do it. There are offers of help out there. I'm one of the ones that offer you to help get things configured. If you're looking for, like, how do I configure this on a Juniper? How do you configure this on a Cisco? If I don't know it, I can find people who will help, right? Juniper, Cisco. Uh, Lucent, Acatel, all those companies actually have, I got buddies in each of them that can say, here's the people that can help you out with it. Um, the identification tools, right? Whether it's using a sinkhole, access lists, you know, um, you know, some of the forensics tools out there. And then when we talk about the sinkhole techniques, you know, there's some really cool, you know, ways of, of identifying what's going on. Classifying the attack, tracing it back so you know where it's coming from. Um, and some of the traceback you can't do by yourself. This is where the peer work come in, because like I say, it's coming in from my network. Um, NSPSEC, one of the core drivers of NSPSEC came out. There's a colleague, uh, Chris Morrow. Is Chris here this time? Chris has a cold. Oh, no, he's sick. 
Um, so uh, he won't be here. But you'll, you'll come to another Natalie where you see him as a tall guy. All right? And <laughs> tall guy. Um, but Chris, um, um, he was at UNIT at the time. He says, Barry, um, you know, um, his, uh, he, 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 wonderful story, right? He says, I call up Sprint, right? And Sprint goes, um, um, I said, I'm trying to trace back a DOS attack. And it's coming from our peer connection. And the Sprint guy says, what's your customer ID? He says, well, I'm not a customer, I'm a peer. He says, well, if you're not a customer, I can't talk to you. <laughs> right? And Chris would be frustrated because he don't know, doesn't know who he's talk, who can talk to. So that's the whole, this operates the security community is important because then he found out at the time there was a, a buddy, Ryan McDowell, who was a security guy there, and he called Ryan up and to be able to trace it back from Sprint and Sprint and say, oh, to AT&T, call 10 battles at AT&T and trace that back over to British Telecom, British Telecom, Dave Hardcore, AT, uh, British Telecom, called a British Telecom guy says, oh, yeah, it's coming from this little computer over here in our hosting center and be able to trace it back. So the trace back is there's things you can do, but it only goes to the edge of your network, right? And sometimes, especially if it's a spoof source, unfortunately, as I said, we have too much spoof source out there, then the, the only way to do it is to work with your peers to work it, work it all the way back. Um, uh, reaction, you know, is what's, that's your toolkit. What do I do to protect myself and have things ready to go to protect myself? Everything ranging from ACLs to other things with it. And, you know, even though we talk about, you know, remote target black hole, you know, ACLs, um, um, you know, and, and especially of NetConf as a tool that allows me to push out with the XML expression out to a large, lot, a large number of routers simultaneously um, gives me, you know, it's still a, a really powerful tool to protect your network as a reaction tool. And then do the post-mortem afterwards. Yes? So the post-mortem thing is hugely important. Like the most you can learn is usually from the post-mortem thing. But you've got to build the culture ahead of time. Mm -hmm. To allow people to actually have a post mortem as the advice that they're going to take care of. And that's always one of the big problems. So you don't have the blame game. The blame game is the, the standard thing that happens with a post mortem. Bob took too long to type that. Right. And fixing the culture so that you know, Bob can stand up and say, I did X and I took too long, and that's why stuff went bad. Right. Is really important and, and really hard to do. That's, that's a yeah. really good point, I think, as we craft the materials that go with it. I know I'm trying to do that from my where I can have a span of control of ISC in a sense of whenever we have a public incidents, so like, you know, we're the buying guys, right, for example, right? And so something happens at DNS, we're starting things up where we're doing postmortems. So we first do a customer-only postmortem, it's a webinar, and then we'll do a public postmortem out there and say, here's what happened. Here's where it broke, right? Sort of, sort of thing. Um, and I think I don't, I don't know if that will help, but it's it's something where people can point to as be honest with things. Things happen on the net, right? And um, we shouldn't be pointing fingers at it. Right. And learn from it. And we'll see some, we got some post-mortem activity going on here. I, I know I wasn't tracking it, but I used to be the Juniper Cert team guy, but the Juniper Cert team guys are here. I guess there's something happened with BGP in November or something. And so somebody's doing a session on, on it. And that's, that's, that's a, you know, all the right people from Juniper are here because, you know, I flew down on the airplane with them. We're all talking, right? And um, that's also being honest, right? Saying like, oh, yeah, something happened. And you can... All the right people are here. If you're interested in, if you haven't talked to them, you can talk to them, right? So the postmortem is important. The culture part, I think I'll take note. That's something to talk more about. So um, thank you for pointing that one out. Okay, so let's talk about what we're about call before our break. So... Um, so we have several people doing, who, who, hands again, who's got remote target black hole set up in the network? Good. All right. So this is for um, all of you who haven't done it yet. Um, and Warren, by the way, what's the RFC that, um, on remote target black source space? Well, right. Remote, I have no idea. Right. 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 I'll have to put the, R, I'll put the RFCs at, out there in the links in the weekends. Right. Um, <laughs> So um, 
so this is, um, uh, as I said, this is kind of like our foundation pool. Um, and this is um, essentially what we're doing is, here's a customer edge. I've been using this diagram before. And how does all work behind the scenes? So this is what we're going to talk about. And then how does this work where industry-wide coordinate across the industry where I do it, and then next provider does it, and then next provider does it, and I push it all the way to the edge to stop something, right? Well, um, there's papers out there still there. The FTP ENG site, I'm surprised, is still all there. There's some uh, Nanog tutorials. This video right here is an old classic one, which is an important one. This is where Chris Morrow, who was still at UUNet, that did that tutorial. So that was the one out there. And that's a really good one because we actually did a demonstration. And because Chris, the night before, says, I want to do a demonstration. Can you get a bunch of routers? And this is at Oakland. So I'm, I'm pulling routers out of my lab in San Jose, Francisco, and bring it over to Oakland. And they set up a lot. They set up a demonstration of it. And then uh, uh, Dugan Turk uh, did this uh, RFC that described it. He was at, um, at the time, he was at Bell Canada. And the reason why he did it from Bell Canada was um, um, he's now at Juniper. But the reason why he did Bell Canada is Bell Canada had a DOS attack, and I got on the phone with them, and they configured it in the middle of an attack. right? And then he, they were so impressed with the technique. and. And, and I was talking to him and says, I have no time to write it. You want to write an RFC? <laughs> and he wrote the RFC on it. Yes? 5635. Ah, okay. So, and this was uh, the 3882, all right? So, black hole filtering, the, the, the approach with it. So, I'm just going to flip through these, go up to. Get the, this kit right there. So, this is a basic one. So, this is, there's. Um, Two basic um, uh, parameters around this. Um, the one I use mostly today is the community-based one. But the, to do the community-based one, you should know the actual static route uh, approach. So this is the static route one. So the static route one, what I'm using here is on all my routers, I'm setting up a trigger. And in my documentation, there's several networks out there I reserve. So 192.02.1 is which network? Anybody know that network? Documentation net. <laughs> it's a documentation net, right? Never to be used on a net, never to be routed on a net, because it's only there for documentation. So if I go through every single one of my routers, OK, and I put this static route in, the risk to the network is zero, because that network doesn't mean anything. <laughs> it's only to be used for documentation. And this is the core preparation step. I go out there and every single one of my net, uh, routers I set up, this particular network equaled null zero. Boom. All right. Now I'm ready to go for remote trigger black hole. Because then I can take a router and configure a trigger router. Trigger router can be a quagga box, right? Could be a little Cisco, could be a little Juniper, just something that speaks BGP. You're not going to take the full tables. All you're going to do is send a route over, right? It's just Warren. Yes. Well, we, we build on that customer trigger black hole. <laughs> the foundations first, right? So this is this is the configure to trigger router, right? So on this step over here, I get all my routers with the same prefix, and I set up a trigger router. Then to activate the black hole, I redistribute the host route from the victim. In other words, take a slash 32, and I set the next hop to the test net, right? Just set that route, set it to test net. I send it into my network. I set the, the no no export, no advertised community. I um, you know, set no export so I don't put out, I put the Murphy filters out there, right? And then the router is propagated to BGP to all the speakers out there, install routers with this particular one out there. And then that means I, my, that route now equals testnet, which is null zero, and the packets go to null zero. So that's the basic approach. So let's see this illustration. So here, step one, I prepare all my routers, set it up there. All equal to no zero. So all my edge so in this case I decide to set all my edge routers up to be that way. Okay? What's that? For advertising a route out? You don't have to. You can do it on I've done it on routers that are live inside of the network. Um, it's just um, yeah, this is my trigger router. So if, if something happens, I unplug the router. Boom. <laughs> Thoughts go away. It's a perfect step. Um, 
you know, it's just engineer it. We're engineers, right? We can engineer it differently in there. This is the fundamentals of it. Uh, prepare the trigger router, right? Can be a separate router. It can be a production router. Oh, so it's a production router put in there. It could be a Quagga Zebra um, uh, router in there. Um, here's kind of like the router configuration using the Cisco configuration for the trigger router. So I set this up where um, I'm not taking anything in, right? So I set up my, my local preference. I set my community no export. Um, usually what I use uh, today, instead of using this, I actually set up another community, um, uh, a, basically a Murphy filter. So I do a no export and then set up another community on it and make sure that community is a no advertised community that doesn't go out. So on the edge of my network, I, I don't allow a community to go out. So I, that way, I, I, if, I, if something happens in no export, I got another community for filtering. So basically, egress filtering going out, I keep these from leaking to prevent route leaks. Um, especially, think of, <laughs> right, this statement right here, see, set community no export is what Pakistan did not do, all right? <laughs> this is what they did not do. They did not reek at this slide and do this. <laughs> and that's what happened to YouTube. <laughs> they didn't do this right here, all right, so. Uh, they weren't paying attention in class. Um, and so uh, so this is kind of like um, the statement of it. So now I activate the black hole. I go out there and, and add IP route, set this no route. So this right here, 172.19.61.1 is actual, you know, that's being hit with a DOS attack. And I set the you know, zero, set it to tag 66, because if you notice back here, um, I use a match tag 66, that approach in the, in the, in the a match approach. So I do tag 66 matches it, has a glue, out it goes out there. Now here's how it works from a, a rib fib perspective. So here's my BGP rib over here, and then I got this coming in with no export, and it comes into the fib and matches through. Down here is a static route, and then it glues together. Here's another illustration. So over here, this is my BGP route. So over here on my BGP route, this guy over here equals the test net, my static route, this equals no zero, they get glued together, this equals this equals this, comes in here in the fib, and now equals no zero. Voila, black hole. And that's the core foundation te technique with it. So the black hole is activated. So now when you see this illustration, that's actually what's happening behind the scenes with it. So, and that guy's down here and he's safe, right? So there's a, another illustration of it with it. Now, the community-based method, this is the, uh, and this is, I'm digging up the white papers I did with this and some of the lab configs. We're actually going to do a lab config for uh, Apricot. So we're going to teach this as a day class in Apricot. We're building up this lab. So if you, that wiki site that I'm pointing you guys over to, the confluence, that isc.org in the SP security space, there'll be labs created on this stuff, right? So, um, um, so you'll be following along with the labs. And on this with the community part, a community part allows me to go through and figure out where I want to drop it across my network. So if I got a big backbone, um, I may want to only drop it on one side of my network and not my other side of the network. I may want to drop it just on my customer edge and not my peer edge. I want to drop it maybe on my peer edge or drop it everywhere. So you can set certain communities up, right? So instead of just having one static route, I'm setting the communities to say, okay, this community means drop everywhere. This community means drop all peers. This community means drop residential customers, right? So I can say, here's how I want to drop. This community means sinkhole it. This community means send it to my clean DOS service. This community means, okay, this is where the community-based method means because different communities will be do different things. Route it this way, route it that way, drop this, drop that. Each community builds up with this. So that's why we use the community method because I can go through and say over here, this community would be my POP customers, this would be my data center, this community would be a corporate network, this would be peer one, peer two, peer three, and then I have a community to do everything. So I can have different communities to do different parts of my network to do different things. So the communities is, is the approach we, we kind of, I walk people through to do now because it gives me basically, here's my index of communities ready to go of what I want to do is I want to move my traffic around and drop it, okay? so. That's remote trigger black hole. Now, source space remote trigger black hole. So, um, Unicast RPF was originally created for BCP38. In other words, how do I go? How do we go out there and validate the source address with it? All right. Then in 2000, we had that DOS attack. 
So, and Martin Winter actually works for me now. <laughs> um, you know Martin Winter? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Open source writing for him. Yes. <laughs> Come on, I have to wait a little quiggy, quiggy uh, uh, chart, chart thing with it, with open source stuff. Uh, so Martin was at Exodus, and there's a couple other guys at Exodus, and I was talking to Exodus about the 2000 attacks, and they, they came up with something that they said, well, we didn't say quite that, but basically I call it the Exodus requirement. How do I, how do I stop, how do I send out, you know, a thousand lines of ACLs to the edge of my network and drop source address and do it all like in real time? Was it just kind of, how do I send out lots of stuff out really fast based off a source address? And I was thinking about this, and wait a minute, I just did this unicast RPF. If I don't do the full check and I do, I combine that with, with remote turbo black hole, I got a technique where I can do a source space drop. So, so what I do here with, with source space drop, remote turbo black hole, right? We just walk through that. Reverse uh, uh, unicast RPF. There are three basic modes out there. Uh, there's the strict mode, which we use for BCP38. There's a loose mode, which only checks in the rib. It doesn't look at the, what port it came in from. There's a feasible path mode, which gives me more flexibility off of what FIB. That's kind of like uh, the Juniper implementation with it. All right. So what I'm looking at is this loose mode, right? So what happens here is strict mode is here's the interface, right? And if it's it's got to come in an interface. If it's if it's if it doesn't match interface and FIB together on the interface, then that source address is not valid, right? So source address comes in. It says I'm supposed to come, basically I'm doing a lookup back to the interface. In other words, if I come in an interface A and my pointer to forward to him it goes to interface A, then it matches. But if I come in interface B, it says, wait a minute, you're supposed to come in interface A. You're coming in B. That's not right. Okay, drop it. So that's strict mode. Strict mode says this interface, source address matches this interface. If it comes in A, matches. If it comes in B, that doesn't match. Okay? So that's strict mode. Right, so this is kind of like illustrations, but it matches in there, right? Loose mode is if it comes in, right, and it says if X, right, if coming in that, that particular interface, you know, as long as it's in the FIB, doesn't matter which interface, right? So the key thing is it doesn't matter which interface, but this is the key thing over here. I can make it into null zero. And if it's null zero and it equals null zero, then drop it. Okay? So this is this is where the little extra thing comes in with it. So now I got a scenario where on strict mode, it's like BCP38, right? And loose mode I can have on my backbone pairs, right? So um, now I take this scenario here on my edge and imagine this based off a source address. Because if I got, got a DOS attack, I can see the destination. And I can see the source addresses. And if I get this list of source addresses, and I put the source addresses in there, and I have on the edge here unicast RPF configured, I can now drop based off those source addresses. So it's a way of me pushing out to the edge with the source address. So down here, I'm doing my same trigger, but now equal the source addresses and goes out to the edge. And now I'm filtering based off of sources. So I got a list of like 3,000 source addresses. Instead of putting those into an access list, I put those into a BGP trigger. It goes into my rib. A rib can take 3,000 entries quite safely, pushes it out there to the edge, all right? And those source addresses will go on to null zero. Or the source addresses, you know, there's other techniques where you can shunt them and stuff, but we'll talk about that one right now, all right? So that's, that's where you got these, all these different source addresses in there, and I can take them in there and they can drop them through with it. So that's the source address one, and there, we got a white paper on or the RFC now on that. Question. Yes. Can you make this work on Juniper, but in loose mode? Yeah. 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 It works on just uh, uh, Cisco and Juniper. So there's source space, remote trigger, black hole works on Cisco and Juniper. Also without turning on accounting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you. I think so. There was Juniper yeah. was trying to add something with the dot only merge to the RPF. Right. We got people doing it on. It's really similar. It does yeah. work. It's yeah. 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 It sort of works okay. For a while, for a while they do, the test was spiked into null zero as a contributing route. I'm sure it was. Right. I'm sure it's still forward, but until they 
what they can tell from that. Yeah. And there's Juniper guys around here. Look up Ron Bonica. Yeah, Ron's supposed to be here. Yeah. So if you're look, looking for a name, you're new to, are you, is this your first time in Nanog? No, second. second time for it. Look for Ron Bonica. Ron Bonica is a Juniper guy to get to know. <laughs> and then uh, Blaine Christian is also here, who's the escalation director. So all your problems are Juniper or Blaine's here. He's wearing a suit. Um, <laughs> I, rolled in, I rolled in with him. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you make a distinction between what's uh, a valid, legitimate traffic versus the, uh, the malicious one? Um, let's say the source addresses, you, um, you, it would be a different tool to actually to figure that out. So say so you, so you got somebody with a DOS attack and you look through those and you sample them and say most of these are spoofed. And then it's, it's a triage thing because who are you contractually obliged to, to work with? You're, you're working with the particular Customer, that's your customer, right? And you take these 3,000 addresses hitting your network and you say, okay, let me go through, see if they, they are anything critical. And okay, none of it's critical. It's a bunch of residential stuff. And I got this DOS attack and I'm trying to tamp it down, right? And you go out there and say, okay, let me use this technique, right? It's a tool in the toolkit. Let me use this tool, try this out. And then you go out there and say, Customer calls up, hey, I can't get to this organization. Says, oh, wow, Yahoo's in there. <laughs> Whoops. Okay, let's pull that rat out. The beauty of a remote target black hole is I go in there and I figure out what the address is that, ha that was linked to Yahoo because you got a customer complaint. I go pull that out. Right? Goes out to BGP, goes out there, pulls out. Right? So it so allows you to respond to, to it as, as you do with it. It's, it's, it's a dynamic sort of, uh, of, of, a, of a impact with it. Yes? So uh, I guess you're saying that there's a rule in USPS that says if the source of the route or definition of the route is no build, then you drop it? Yes. Okay. That's, that's a core thing with the loose mode. Loose mode is if null zero, then drop. Well, it's like it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist, or right. Or right. Right, and that's where the 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 um, if it doesn't exist um, helps also because you can have spoofed. So if you this is where the uh, uh, the BGP filtering comes in because you can go through on the BGP filtering and, and be pretty strict on your BGP filtering. And if there are routes out there which are not many left that are not yet advertised, and, uh, because all the addresses are allocated, not used but allocated. Like before. before, yes. Um, then, uh, yeah, that's true, but I don't know how, if they, if Cisco and Jennifer's got V6, Unicast RPF. <laughs> uh, but it, it will, you know, if it's not there. But when this was originally created uh, uh, many years ago, uh, it had an impact. I don't, if it doesn't exist, I don't, that, that has a, a big impact now. So the null zero part is uh, probably the most applicable use. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we have break time. There's supposed to be refreshments, so we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come on back here after the break, right? And um, I think we're starting at 4, right? And uh, we'll come back and do some more sessions. We'll talk about sinkholes and some of the other stuff. Email me, and then we could talk. I'm only here for a short time because I got to head back tomorrow. Okay. Um, but introducing some of my colleagues and stuff. Okay. Because um, I got, you know, Medica, Medica Chaos here. She's all the one who's writing stuff. Okay. So, so we just email to start up. Or you, like access to the, to the we require a console, so you access to the space and you're writing stuff with it and add and things with it. Okay. And then things on your network. Okay. And you're doing some stuff on your network. Yep. 
the wish list. Hey, I wish we could do it. Let's develop it. Uh, are you on NSP stack doing any groups like that? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, NSP stack, I have to ask as well. I'm happy for you. Come, come to the ROM. Okay. Which is today or tomorrow? Tomorrow.